Hi, I'm Chris Hedges. Welcome to The Real News. I'm speaking with Robert Scheer, uh, one of the premier journalists, certainly one of the journalists I admire most in the United States, uh, the editor of Truth Dig, and I write a column for Truth Dig for Bob. Uh, and we're talking about his new book, They Know Everything About You, How Data Collecting Corporations and Snooping Government Agencies Are Destroying Democracy, uh, which uh, is a brilliant explication of the security and surveillance apparatus and the fusion of government and corporate power into uh, every aspect of our lives. Uh, and. Uh, Let's begin a little bit about how this started, how it began. Well, I think the surveillance state has been with us in one form or another. You just go watch the movie Selma and we're, look at what was done to Martin Luther King. And I remember those days well. I was editing Ramparts magazine. We exposed the CIA. In turn, they went after us. We were audited. We were followed. Our, office was broken into, and we published King. And I remember the uh, way King became, began to be seen not as a convenient icon, but rather as a radical thinker. And it was particularly when he opened uh, his support to SNCC, the younger radicals in the civil rights movement, and then when he came out against the Vietnam War, when he gave that speech, uh, actually he did it before, but the most prominent was his speech at Riverside Church, where he condemned the U.S. government. And, and, and he did because of photos you ran in Ramparts magazine. Yeah, but he was going to do it anyway. He was moving, and no, and he gave the reasons in his speech. It wasn't just those photos. It was, as he said in the speech, how can I go into the ghetto and tell young blacks uh, to shun violence and to embrace nonviolence, and yet they're drafted to go fight in Vietnam where, in his words, the U.S. government is the major purveyor of violence in the world today. Uh, so, you know, to have Martin Luther King reduced to a statue or a holiday as an inoffensive, benign figure is absurd. And, and what I tell my students when they say, oh, what does it matter if we give all this information to the government? Well, it does matter. Martin Luther King, if you had today's surveillance apparatus, Martin Luther King would have been destroyed. Right. Because in, in those days, you had to have somebody in the hotel room next to him listening or physically tapping into the phone, following him. And I worked in totalitarian countries. I was in the old Soviet Union. I was in Egypt after the Six Day War and other countries. Uh, and, uh, you know, you knew when you were being followed or you could assume you would know when you're being followed and you acted accordingly. But in today's, uh, with today's technology, uh, you have the ability to know what book did Martin Luther King read, how, what, up to what page, and then who, who did he associate with. And then you can doctor it. You can make up a new profile. You can mix, ma mix and match uh, the data. I think of someone like Elliot Spitzer. Elliot Spitzer was probably the most, from my point of view, the most promising progressive politician the Democratic Party had as Attorney General and Governor of New York. He went after the banks. He was consistent. And what did I find? I find him in a, with prostitutes in some situation. How? Because they have all the records, all right. of your financial transactions, every movement you made. And they want to destroy this guy who, you know, if you look at a movie like Wolf of Wall Street, evidently they all do cocaine and they all have prostitutes. So what Elliot Spitzer is accused of doing is rather minor. Uh, I, but on the other hand, it finished him, actually right. finished him. And so the things that changed, I wrote an article where the book began is I wrote an article in the late 90s for Yahoo Internet Life, I did a whole issue on privacy and the loss of privacy. And I was driven to do that because of the argument around the Financial Services Modernization Act, uh, otherwise known as the act that reversed Glass-Steagall, that destroyed the main regulatory mechanism of, of the New Deal, uh, that separated commercial and investment banks from insurance companies and so forth. And in the debate, uh, not much of a debate, but those who opposed uh, this uh, devilish thing that Clinton had come up with, Phil Graham, a Republican-Democratic cooperative, that was what my last book was about, 
they were going to allow insurance companies with medical records and you know your most intimate medical to merge with commercial banks that are going to see whether you were should have a loan and with investment banks that knew about the rest of your activity and all of this data was going to be merged and a few sensible souls who understood something about uh, the thirst for privacy in this country that goes back not just to the Fourth Amendment, but actually goes back all the way to the Magna Carta and English common law after that. Uh, people, uh, a few of them, raised this question, what happens to privacy when you're merging all this data at a time when you have supercomputers, when you can store this data, when you can sort through it, and so forth, you know? And when people are surrendering more and more uh, data, that was, so I did, I got interested in that. And at that time, and they emerged as kind of, uh, prescient, uh, somewhat heroic figures, uh, somebody like Bill Sapphire, who I never thought I would write a book uh, in indicating any admiration for Bill Sapphire, who was Nixon's speechwriter, chief speechwriter, who then became a columnist for the New York Times. But he certainly sounded the alarm. And interestingly enough, sounded the alarm about too big to fail as well. When I went back and looked at his columns, it was privacy, but also why do we want these banks to be so big? So there was a little bit of the genuine libertarian free market idea, but he sounded the alarm on privacy. And he actually opposed not just that, but the total awareness state and all that stuff that was emerging. Uh, Ed Markey, who's now a senator from Massachusetts, was a younger congressman. He also uh, raised this argument. And they said Bill Clinton should veto that bill for a number of reasons, but certainly on privacy. The banks, which had put in $300 million to get that legislation, said, no, you, get, you end our ability to merge this data. We don't care about merging. It's the data we want so we can more effectively market. And what I came to realize then that this internet, uh, and I'm not a Luddite, I had an internet publication. I did my first year in graduate school. I, worked on an IBM computer that was in a warehouse, had less power than my smartphone does now. I, I uh, studied engineering originally in college. I like technology. I'm an early adapter for every gadget. Uh, and and I, I do applaud the internet as a great educational tool. We, we used to talk about having to learn Esperanto or some artificial language to talk internationally. Uh, now with the internet, we have instant translation. At Truthdig, we put up a Hedges article and somebody in Shanghai could see it at night. Someone in Shanghai has just read it. Someone in Dublin has just read it. It's been translated automatically and so forth. So I, I applaud the internet as a great way. It used to be, a, yeah, as a teacher, I teach at the USC, University of Southern California. If I get a kid interested, in something in the old days, they'd have to go to a major library in a major city to read something about what was Watergate or what was this. Uh, now they get online. In a couple of hours, they know more than their parents do about Watergate or any other subject, you know, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution or any other such thing. So I, I, I love the internet, uh, but the enemy of the internet is something called targeted advertising. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's the ability to sell stuff with an efficiency of a, of a heat-seeking missile uh, because people surrender their personal information for convenience. And uh, we increasingly have come to define the act of freedom as consumer sovereignty, not individual sovereignty, which was the basic notion of the American Constitution. We have the power as individuals, at least white males, yes, imperfect document, as Howard Zinn and others have pointed out eloquently, but at the heart of the Constitution was an incredible notion that power should begin with the individual and that the individual then surrenders power to the common good, the state or federal government, but it is power that can be withdrawn, can be checked, uh, checks and balances, division of power. And the odd thing is that notion of limited government was put into the Constitution and they accepted the Bill of Rights by people who were going to be the government. And basically, Jefferson, Madison, uh, Hamilton, uh, you know, Washington, all said, watch us. 
Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. You need, to, it wasn't, when they put in the freedom of the press, they knew the press was scurrilous and mean and nasty. They knew speech could be mean and nasty, you know, uh, Washington's a crook, uh, a philanderer, or whatever. You know, the terrible things were said about all these folks. And they knew when you assembled for a redress of grievances, you might be wrong, or you might be exaggerated in your claim of grievances. There were at least one third of the people who opposed the American Revolution who were living here and thought these people were scoundrels. So they were going to be the government and they empowered the citizenry to check that government, to challenge it fundamentally. After 9-11, and this was after I wrote that article for, or did the whole cover issue for Yahoo Internet Life, this event, which in the, you know, the threats facing nations was really not existential. Right. Uh, you know, we have the strongest military in the world that's not going to be overthrown. But somehow, and compared to the founders, who after all, the English could come back, did come back, and they would be hanging from some tree. Uh, nonetheless, after 9-11, this became the excuse for ramping up the surveillance state, unprecedented proportion. And I think that uh, be combined with the fact that you have the ability to sift through information and that the public volunteers all this information presented a, a, a toxic mix uh, which has threatened uh, whatever hope we had for democracy at this point. Although, of course, at this point, they have a lot of information we don't volunteer. Um, well, it, it is true that we volunteer, but they have our medical records, they have arrest, uh, you know, legal records, they have everything. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly the point of the book and, and for two reasons. One, if this material was being volunteered uh, in a tra and in the process was transparent, and this was the issue in the uh, objection of Sapphire and Markey and others to Glass-Steagall, they said if you're going to let have people volunteer this information, this data you're going to be mining and merging, okay, it has to be totally transparent, and then when they know what you're doing before you merge this data, you should have to be required, this company, whether it's Apple or Google or Facebook or anyone else, Chase Manhattan Bank, a traveler's insurance, they should have to go back to the individual because the individual should own that data and it should have the opt-in principle. That sounds boring and archaic, you know, opt-in. It's very clear. And when people say we can't stop this, it's, it's rubbish. You can stop it. If, if Bill Clinton had said, this is what Sapphire and Markey, I should have made this point, this is what they said, put in opt-in. Before travelers, when they merge with Citibank and become you know, uh, the, the, the biggest bank in the world that then had to be bailed out by taxpayers, before they can merge that data, they should have to go back to you and say, you gave your medical records to travelers, and now Chase is going to have it, okay, or City is going to have it. We have to ask you, do you give permission? That's called opt-in. But, but in the book, you describe, uh, you know, the, I think it's with Google, the, you know, or Facebook, where they uh, create a mechanism by which you can click a box saying that you're not allowed to share this information. I mean, I have it technically correct, uh, but they rewrite the rules so it, they can share it if they want to. Um, yes. So, I mean, this is what we've seen throughout both the legislative and the judicial process. Um, that when there is any kind of an outcry, they, they uh, essentially once again game the system um, by having uh, a kind of facade, de dealing with it uh, in terms of, uh, you know, rhetorically, but not substantially. Right. And for the reasons you're the person that we both admire, Ralph Nader, makes clear, there is no real consumer protection. Right. So we have this false notion of consumer sovereignty, to have real consumer sovereignty, even if we assume that's the only area where freedom should matter, which it shouldn't. We should care about political freedom and, you know, uh, social freedom and so forth. But a, a robust notion of consumer sovereignty should mean that you have transparency, you know what's done with your data, you know how you're being manipulated and whether you agree uh, to it. And, and that you know, was the idea. And I don't want to lose track of that because when they say, oh, you can't do anything about it or the cat's out of the bag, or, nonsense. If right now our government were to say, no, you cannot mine data, you cannot mix it, you must go back to the consumer and have their permission. 
They've given uh, some medical center their data. No, you can't sell that data to a third party. You can't use it for your affiliate. You have to go back and say, we're going to use your medical record to give it to the banks to decide whether you're a good risk on a loan. Well, most people would say, no, I don't right. want you to do that. And what we have instead is this opt out thing. If you should learn that your data is being used, maybe you could write a letter, maybe something would happen. So we don't have transparency. We don't really have an honest connection between the consumer and these companies. That's true. But what Edward Snowden did, and the reason he's one of the most important individuals to emerge in modern American history, is that the courage of this 29-year-old at the time in turning over this massive amount of data made it irrefutable that this government has destroyed the notion of the free market. That, that's what is being ignored uh, by the people who call Snowden a traitor. I think. Snowden provided this incredibly and valuable educational service to say there is no private sector, that the private and the government are merged. Right. This is the military industrial complex with a vengeance that Eisenhower warned about, but now it's a military intelligence complex and you know the internet was formed by DARPA by the Defense Department the original purpose of the internet was in the event of a nuclear war to have redundancy in communication how do you communicate when the nuclear explosions are going off so it can't be a centralized system the internet is built on a decentralized system to withstand that an attack, okay? However, it was learned, it's a great means of communication. It had a robust life, it's expanded. But the main reason it's expanded is because it's a great source of profit, right. uh, not for those who produce content, whether it's the New York Times or Truth Dig, we're all hurting. <laughs> you know, anyone who, who really who produces plays or writes poems or music, we're all hurting, all of us out there. But it's a great source of profit for the aggregators, why Google, you know, Facebook, uh, so forth? Because they get this data. They get your private data, and they can do the targeted advertising. So you're reading an article about shoes, and suddenly there are ads for shoes. And then, oh, that's a customer we want. We can find out where they go, where they live, how they shop, how much money they have. And you have this heat-seeking uh, missile of targeted advertising. Okay. That was acceptable to most of the world's consumers as long as they thought it was totally in the private sector. Yeah, it's nice to know what restaurant is near me. It's good to know what shoes to, are being sold. That was, even seems like a bargain. But when you mix that, all that data, and you say, as Edward Snowden revealed, that that's all available to the government, whether Google wants it or not, we can argue about the degree of complicity, but there's no question after Snowden that there are no barriers to the government grabbing that data. They go under the ocean and cut into fiber optic cable and scoop it all up. They, they set up dummy uh, cell stations and listening posts all over the world. They go through the back door uh, channel, Google. They implant, so we now know, uh, SIM cards that are in everything, every phone, everything, that we've had billions of SIM cards phonied up and so they're in people's phone. And so even when the phone is off, it becomes a mechanism for spying on you in your bedroom, in your most intimate meetings. Uh, if you want to talk to people about maybe joining Occupy or joining the Tea Party, uh, they can spy on, on your a meeting. Uh, so what we've had is actually uh, a subversion of this very exciting technology, which could bring people together and communicate and turns it into a spying mechanism. And, and the irony right now is that because it threatens, once Snowden revealed this, the intimate relationship between these big internet companies and the government, which I discuss in the book, uh, you know, right up to the highest level, once Snowden revealed it, it became untenable uh, for my, in the eyes of many people in the world, less so in this country, because we have a, a, a really distorted view of government as opposed to the uh, concerns of the founders that we should regard government with suspicion. We've now been propagandized to think of government as benign and only protecting us against terrorists and so forth, but most of the world will not see that way. They see an American company that claims to be a multinational, 
claims to be above national. That's what a multinational is. You know, they're rising to a higher purpose, at least a higher purpose of selling us stuff all over the world. So they have to be loyal to consumers all over the world. Well, if they're just a puppet of the NSA, the CIA, the FBI, why should anyone in Germany trust those little Google trucks to ride around all your neighborhood taking pictures of your houses so that those pictures can show up back in all over the United States. Well, what does the FBI do with those pictures? Right. Or they're photographing your biometrics. Or you buy an iPhone 6 or, and you give the thumbprint. Right. You know, hundreds of times a day, every time you buy a book, every time you go to a movie, every time you have a meal, and then your thumbprint is compared to other people's thumbprints. And you have people, you know, they have the most uh, in inclusive uh, evidence of every moment of your life, everything you're doing, and correlating it now with supercomputers and vast data storage, it, the haystack is is infinite. Right. Okay. And as people like the uh, William Binney and uh, T Drake and uh, Thomas Drake and others have pointed out, is woefully inefficient as far as right. stopping terrorism. Or, or, or well, that's, so that's not why it's designed. Yeah, it's not why it's designed. Uh, we'll, we're going to come back uh, with part two uh, with this interview with Robert Shear, the author of They Know Everything About You. Uh, so please join me for part two with Robert Shear. <laughs>